Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us today for the virtual Vertica BDC 2020. Today's breakout session is entitled Machine Learning with Vertica, Data Preparation and Model Management. My name is Sue LeClaire, Director of Marketing at Vertica, and I'll be your host for this webinar. Joining me is Wakas Dillon, part of the Vertica Product Management Team at Vertica. Before we begin, I want to encourage you to submit questions or comments during the virtual session. You don't have to wait. Just type your question or comment in the question box below the slides and click Submit. There will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We'll answer as many questions as we're able to during that time. Any questions that we don't address, we'll do our best to answer offline. Alternately, you can visit Vertica Forums to post your questions there after the session. Our engineering team is planning to join the forums to keep the conversation going. Also, a reminder that you can maximize your screen by clicking the double arrow button in the lower right corner of the slides. And yes, this virtual session is being recorded and will be available to view on demand later this week. We'll send you a notification as soon as it's ready. So let's get started. Wakas, over to you. Thank you, Sue. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Wakas Dillon, and I'm a product manager here at Vertica. Um, so today we're going to uh, go through data preparation and model management in Vertica. Uh, and the session would uh, essentially be uh, starting with some introduction and going through some of the machine learning considerations when you're doing machine learning at scale. Um, after that, uh, we have two major sections here. Uh, the first one is on data preparation. So we'd go through what data preparation is, what are the Vertica functions for data exploration and data preparation, and um, then share an example with you. Uh, similarly, uh, in the second part of uh, this talk, we'll go through import and export models uh, using PMML uh, and how that works with Vertica, and we'll share examples for that as well. So yeah, let's uh, dive right in. Um, so Vertica essentially is an open architecture with a rich ecosystem, so you have a lot of options for data transformation and ingesting data from different tools. Um, and then you also have options for um, connecting through ODBC, JDBC, and some other connectors to uh, BI and visualization tools. There's a whole lot of them uh, uh, that Vertica connects to. Um, and in the middle um, sits Vertica, which you can have on external tables, or uh, you know you can have uh, in-place uh, analytics on Arc, on Cloud, or on on-prem. So that choice is yours. But essentially, what it does is it offers you a lot of options for performing your data analytics on scale. And within that data analytics, machine learning is also a core component. Um, and then you, know, you, you have a lot of options and functions for that. Now, machine learning um, in Vertica is actually built on top of the architecture that the distributed analytic database offers. So it um, offers a lot of those uh, uh, capabilities and builds on top of them. So um, you eliminate the overhead of data transfer when you're uh, working with Vertica machine learning. You keep your data secure, storing and uh, managing the models. That's um, really easy and uh, much more efficient. Um, you can serve a lot of uh, concurrent users uh, to, um, all at the same time. And then it's really scalable um, and avoids the maintenance cost of a separate system. So essentially a lot of benefits here. Uh, but uh, one important uh, thing to mention here is that all of the algorithms that you see, whether they are analytics functions, advanced analytics functions, or machine learning functions, uh, they are distributed not just across uh, the cluster on different nodes. So each node has uh, gets a distributed workload. On each node, too, there might be multiple threads and multiple processes uh, that are running with each of these functions. Uh, so highly distributed solution and uh, sort of uh, one of its kind uh, in this uh, space. So uh, when we talk about vertical machine learning, it uh, essentially covers the whole machine learning process, and we see it as something started starting with data ingestion and doing data analysis and understanding, uh, going through the steps of data preparation, modeling, evaluation, and finally deployment as well. Um, so when you're using with Vertica, uh, you're using Vertica for machine learning, it takes care of all these steps, and you can do all of that inside of uh, the Vertica database. Uh, but when we, we look at um, you know, the three main pillars that Vertica machine learning aims um, uh, to build on, the first one is to have Vertica as a platform for high-performance machine learning. Um, we have a lot of functions for data exploration and preparation. We'll go through them, um, some of them here. Uh, we have distributed in-database algorithms for model training and uh, prediction. Uh, we have scalable functions for model evaluation, and finally, we have distributed scoring functions as well. Uh, but you know, doing all of the stuff in the database, that's, that's a really good thing, but we don't want to uh, be isolated in this space. We understand that a lot of our customers, our users, 
um, they they like to work with other tools and work with Vertica as well. So you know they might use Vertica for data prep, but another tool for uh, model training, or use uh, you know Vertica for model training and take those models out to other tools and do prediction there. So integration is really important um, part of um, our overall offering. Uh, so. It's it's a pretty flexible system. Uh, we uh, have been offering UDXs in four languages, a lot of development there over the past uh, a few years. But uh, the new capability of importing PML models for inter-database scoring and exporting uh, Vertica native models for external scoring is um, you know something that we have recently added. Um, and another talk uh, would actually go through um, the TensorFlow integration, some a really um, exciting and important milestone that we have, where you can bring TensorFlow models into Vertica for inter-database scoring. For this talk, we'll focus um, on data exploration and preparation, importing PMML, and exporting PMML models. Uh, and finally, uh, since Vertica is not just a QE engine, but also a data store, so uh, we have a lot of really good uh, capability for model storage and management as well. So yeah, let's uh, dive into uh, the first part on machine learning at scale. So um, when we say machine learning at scale, we're uh, actually having um, a few really important considerations, and they have their own implications. Uh, the first one is that we want uh, to have speed, uh, but also want it to come at a reasonable cost. Um, so it's really important for us to pick the right scaling architecture. Um, secondly, it's, it's not easy to move big data around. It might be easy to do that on a smaller data set, on an Excel sheet, or something um, of the like, but once you're Talking about big data and um, data analytics um, at really big scale, um, it's, it's really not easy to move that data around um, from one tool to another. So what you'd want to do is bring models to the data instead of having to move this data to the tools. Um, and the third thing here is that some subsampling, it can actually compromise your accuracy and a lot of tools that, uh, that are out there uh, they actually force you to um, take smaller samples of your data because they can only handle so much data. Uh, but that can impact your accuracy, and uh, the need here is that you, you should be able to work with all of uh, your data. We, uh, we'll just uh, go through each of uh, these really quickly. Uh, so the first uh, aspect here is scalability. Now, if you want to scale your architecture, you have uh, two main, main options. The first is vertical scaling, uh, where let's say you have a machine, a server, uh, essentially, and you can keep on adding resources like RAM and CPU and uh, keep on you know, in increasing the performance as well as um, the capacity of that system, but there's, there's um, a limit to what you can do here. And the limit, uh, you can hit that in terms of cost as well as in terms of technology. Uh, beyond a certain point, you would not be able to scale more. Um, so the right solution to uh, follow here is actually horizontal scaling um, in which you can keep on adding more instances to have more computing power um, and more um, capacity. So essentially, uh, what you get with this um, sort of an architecture is a supercomputer which stitches together um, several nodes, um, and, uh, the, and the workload is distributed on each of those nodes um, for um, massively parallel processing and uh, really fast speeds as well. Um, the second aspect of uh, you know having uh, big data and it, the difficulty around uh, moving uh, it around is um, actually you know can be clarified with this example. So what usually happens is that you um, and this is a simplified version. You have a lot of um, applications and tools from which you might be collecting the data, and this data then goes into um, an analytics database. Um, that database then in turn might be connected to some BI tools, dashboards, and applications, some ad hoc queries um, being done on the database. Now that, that when you want to do machine learning in this architecture, what usually happens is that you have your machine learning tools, uh, and the data that, that is coming into the analytics database is actually being exported out to the machine learning tools. Um, you're training your models there, and afterwards, when you have new incoming data, that data again goes out to the machine learning tools for prediction. But those results that you get from those tools um, usually end up back in the distributed database because you want to put it on dashboard, or you want to um, power up some applications with that. Uh, so there's essentially a lot of um, data overhead that's involved here. Um, there are problems with that, including data governance, data movement, um, and other complications that you need to resolve here. Uh, one of the possible solutions to overcome that difficulty is uh, that you have machine learning as part of the distributed analytical database as well. Um, so you get the benefits of um, you know having uh, it applied on all of the data that's inside the database and not uh, having to care about all the data movement there. Uh, but you know, if there are some use cases um, where it still makes sense to at least train the models outside, uh, that's where you can do um, uh, your data preparation inside the database and then take the data out, the prepared data, build your model, and then bring the uh, model back to the uh, analytics database. In, in this case, we'll talk about Vertica. Uh, so the model would be archived, hosted by uh, Vertica, and then um, you can you know, keep on uh, applying predictions on the new data that's incoming uh, into the database. 
So uh, the, the third consideration here uh, for machine learning on scale uh, is sampling versus full data set. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of tools, they cannot handle uh, big data, and you are forced to subsample. But, but what happens here, um, as you can see in the figure uh, on the leftmost uh, figure A, is that if you have a single data point, essentially any model can explain that. Uh, but if you have um, you know, more data points, as in figure B, uh, there would be a smaller number of models that would be able to explain that. And in figure C, you know, even um, more data points, lesser number of models to explain. But lesser also means here that these models would probably be more accurate. And the objective for building machine learning models is mostly uh, to have prediction capability um, and generalization capability essentially on unseen data. So if you build a model that's accurate on one data point, it would not have re uh, very good gen generalization capability. Um, the conventional wisdom uh, with machine learning is that the more data points that you have and uh, for learning, uh, the better and more accurate models that you'll get out of uh, your uh, your more uh, machine learning models. So uh, you you need to pick a tool which can handle all of your data and does not force you uh, to subsample that. And doing that, even a simpler model might be much better than a more complex uh, model here. So yeah, let's go to uh, data exploration and data preparation part. Um, so Vertica is a really powerful tool and it offers a lot of capabilities in this space. Um, and as I mentioned, we support the whole process. Um, you can define the problem and you can gather your data and construct your data set inside Vertica. Um, and then comes the data prep part, training modeling, uh, deployment, and uh, managing the model. Uh, but this is a really critical step in the overall machine learning process. Um, by some estimates, it, it takes between 60 to 80 percent of the overall effort of a machine learning process. Um, so uh, a lot of functions here uh, you can use uh, part of Vertica to uh, data exploration, deduplication, outlier detection, balancing, normalization, and, and uh, essentially a lot more. Uh, you can actually go to uh, Vertica's documentation and uh, find them there. Within Vertica, we actually um, uh, divide them into two parts. Um, Within data prep, one is exploration functions. The second is transformation functions. Uh, now, within exploration, um, you have um, a rich set of functions that you can use um, in DB. And then if you want to build your own, you can use the UDXs to do that. Uh, similarly, for uh, transformation, uh, there's a lot of functions around time series, pattern matching, outlier detection that you can use uh, to transform that data. Um, and uh, um, it's, it's just a snapshot of some of those functions uh, that are available in Vertica right now. Um, and again, the good thing about these functions is not just their presence in the database. The good thing is actually their ability to scale on really, really large data sets and be able to compute those results uh, for you on that data set in an acceptable uh, amount of time, uh, which makes your uh, machine learning processes uh, really uh, practical. So uh, let's go to an example and see in how we can use some of these functions. As I mentioned, there's a whole lot of them, and we'd not be able to go through uh, all of them. but uh, uh, just for our understanding, we can um, we can go through some of them and see how they work. Uh, so we have here a sample uh, data set um, of uh, network flows. We, it, it's a simulated um, attack uh, for, from some uh, source nodes, and then there are some um, uh, some victim nodes on which these attacks are happening. Um, so yeah, let's uh, just look at the data here real quick. Uh, we'll load the data. We'll browse the data. Uh, compute some statistics around it, ask some questions, make plots, and, and then clean the data. The objective here is not to make a prediction per se, which is uh, what we mostly do in machine learning algorithms, but to uh, just go through the data prep uh, process and see how easy it is to do that with Vertica and what kind of options uh, might be there uh, to help you through that process. So the first step is loading the data. Since in this case, we know the structure of the data, so we create a table and um, create different column names and um, data types. Uh, but let's say you have a data set for which you do not already know the structure. There's a really cool feature in Vertica called flex tables, and you can use that to initially import the data into the database and then go through uh, uh, all of the variables and then assign them variable types. And you, know, uh, if, you can also use that if your data is dynamic and it's changing uh, to import the data first and then uh, uh, create these definitions. So once we've done that, we um, load that data uh, into uh, the database. Um, it's, it's for one week of uh, data out, out of the whole data set right now. Uh, but once you've done that, uh, we'd like to uh, look at the flows, just a, just a look at the data, you know, how it looks. Um, and once we do select start from flows um, and, uh, you know, just have a limit here, we see that there's already uh, some data duplication. And by duplication, I mean rows which have the exact same data uh, for each of the columns. So uh, as part of the cleaning process, the first thing we'd want to do is probably to remove that duplication. So we create a table with distinct flows. Um, and you can see here, um, we have about a million uh, flows here, uh, which are um, unique. 
So moving on, uh, the next step we want to do here is we want to, uh, you know, we, this is essentially time series data, and uh, there's seven days in a week. Um, so we want to look at the trends of this data. So the network traffic that's there, um, we, you can call it flows. Um, so, um, you know, based on hours of the day, how does the traffic move, and how does it uh, differ from one day to another? So it's part of an exploration process. There might be a lot of other exploration uh, that you want to do, uh, but we, we, we can start with this one um, and see how it goes. Uh, and you can see in, in the graph here that uh, we have seven days of data, uh, and the weekend traffic, which is in pink and purple here, uh, seems a little different from the rest of the days, uh, pretty close to each other, uh, but yeah, uh, definitely something we can uh, look into and see if uh, there's some real difference, um, and if there's something we want to explore further here. Uh, but the thing is that this is just data for uh, one week, as I mentioned. Uh, what if we load data for 70 days? You'd have a longer graph probably, but um, a lot of uh, lines uh, and would not be able to really make sense out of that data. Uh, it would be a really crowded plot for, uh, for that matter. So we have to come up with a better way of uh, being able to explore that, and we'll come back to that uh, in a little bit. So uh, what are some other things that we can uh, do? We can get some statistics. We can um, take one sample flow um, and look at some of the values here. Uh, we see that uh, the forward column here and TOS column here, uh, they have zero values. And uh, when we explore further, we see uh, that there's a lot of, uh, uh, lot of uh, values here or uh, records here for which these columns are essentially zero, so probably not really helpful for our uh, use case. Uh, then we can look at the flow end. So flow end is the end time when um, the last packet in uh, a flow was sent. Um, and you can do a select min flow and max flow end to see um, you know, the data when it started and when it uh, ended. And uh, you can see it's uh, uh, about uh, one week of data from the first till eighth. Now we also want to look at the data, whether it's balanced or not, because balanced data is really important for a lot of uh, classification use cases that we want to try uh, this uh, with this. Um, and you can see that um, you know source address, destination address, um, source port, and destination port. And you can see um, it's highly imbalanced data in source versus destination address space. So uh, probably something that we need to do. Um, uh, really powerful vertical balancing uh, functions that you can use with min, uh, undersampling, oversampling, or hybrid sampling here. Um, and that can become, uh, be really useful here. Um, another thing we can um, look at is uh, you know uh, the summary statistics of uh, these columns. So of the unique flows table that we created. Uh, we uh, just use the summarize numcall function in Vertica, and it, it gives us a lot of pretty cool count, mean, stand dev, and percentile information on that. Now, if we look at the duration, which is the, the last uh, record here, um, we can see that the mean is around 4.6 seconds, but when we look at the percentile information, we see that the median is around uh, 0.27. So there's a lot of short flows, um, flows that have duration less than 0.27 uh, seconds. Um, yes, there would be uh, more, and they would probably be uh, bring the mean to uh, the 4.6 value, uh, but then uh, the number of short flows is probably pretty high. Um, we can ask some other questions from um, the data about the features. We can look at the protocols here and look at the count. So we see that uh, most of the traffic that we have is for TCP and uh, UDP, which is um, sort of expected uh, for a data set like this. Um, and then we want to look at, you know, what are the most uh, popular network services here? So again, uh, simple query here, select destination port count, uh, and other information uh, here we, we get is the destination port and count for each. Uh, so we can see that um, the most of the traffic here is web traffic, HTTP, and HTTPS, uh, followed by um, domain name uh, resolution. Um, so let's explore some more. Uh, we can look at the label distributions. We see um, that the labels that, that are given with that, because this is uh, essentially data for which we already know uh, whether something was an anomaly or not, um, record was an anomaly or not, and we can train our algorithm based on it. So we see that um, there's uh, this background label, um, a lot of records there, and then anomaly spam seems to be uh, really uh, high. Uh, there are anomaly UDP scans and uh, SSH scans as well. Um, so. Another question we can ask is like among the SMTP flows, um, how labels are distributed? And we can say that anomaly spam uh, is highest um, and then uh, comes the background spam. So can we say out of this that uh, um, SMTP flows, um, they're, they're spams and maybe we can build a model that uh, actually answers that question for us? Um, that, that can be one uh, machine learning model that you can build out of this data set. Um, again, we can also verify the destination port of flows uh, that were labeled as spam. Um, so. Uh, you um, you can expect port 25 for SMTP service here, and we can see that uh, SMTP um, with destination port 25, you have a lot of um, uh, counts 
here, but then there are some other destination ports for which the count is really low. And essentially, when we are um, doing an analysis at this scale, uh, these data points might not really be needed. So as part of the data prep slash data cleaning, we might want to get rid of uh, these records here. Um, so now uh, what we can do is, um, going back to the graph that I showed earlier, we can uh, try and plot the daily trends uh, by aggregating them. Um, again, uh, we uh, take the unique flows and uh, convert it into a, into a flow count, into a manageable number that we can uh, then feed into one of the algorithms. Now, uh, PCA, Principal Component Analysis, it's um, a really powerful algorithm in Vertica. Uh, and what it essentially does is um, a lot of times when you have uh, a high number of columns which might be highly correlated with each other, uh, you can feed them into um, the PCA algorithm and it would um, uh, get uh, for you um, a list of uh, principal components which would be uh, linearly independent from each other. Now, each of these components would um, explain um, a certain extent of the variance of um, the overall data set that you have. Uh, so you can see here component one explains about 73.9% of the variance and component two uh, explains about 16% uh, of the variance. So um, if you combine that, uh, those uh, two components alone uh, would uh, capture for around 90% of the variance. Now. You can use PCA for a lot of uh, different purposes, but in this specific example, we want to see uh, if we combine all the data points that we have together and we uh, do that by day of the week, uh, what sort of information can we get out of it? Is there any um, sort of insight that, that uh, this provides? Because uh, once you have two data points, it's really easy to plot them. So uh, we just uh, uh, apply the PCA. We first train it and then we apply it on um, our uh, data set. Um, and this is uh, the graph we get as a result. Now, you can see uh, component one is on the x-axis here, component two on the y-axis, um, and uh, each of uh, these uh, points um, represents a day of the week. Uh, now, with uh, just two points, it's easy to plot that, and um, compare this to the graph that we saw earlier, which had a lot of lines, and uh, the more weeks that we added, or more days we added, uh, the more lines we would have, uh, versus this graph in which you can clearly tell that five days traffic uh, starting from Monday till Friday, that's closely clustered together, so probably uh, pretty similar uh, uh, to each other. And then uh, Saturday traffic is uh, uh, pretty much apart from all of these days, and it's also farther away from Sunday. Uh, so these two days of traffic is different from other days of the traffic, and we can always dive deeper into this and look at you know what exactly is happening here um, and uh, see how this traffic is um, actually different. But uh, with just you know a few functions and uh, some pretty uh, simple SQL queries, uh, we were already able to get a pretty good insight from uh, the data set that we had. Now uh, let's move on to our uh, next uh, part of this, uh, this talk uh, on importing and exporting PMML models uh, to and from Vertica. So uh, current common practice uh, is uh, that when you're putting your machine learning models into production, you'd have a dev or a test environment, and in that you might be using a lot of uh, different tools, uh, um, scikit-learn, Spark, R. Um, and once you want to deploy these models into production, you'd uh, put them into containers, and there would be a pool of containers in the production environment uh, which would be talking to your database. Uh, it could be your analytical database. Um, and all of the new data that's incoming would be coming into the database itself. Uh, so as I mentioned in uh, one of the slides earlier, uh, there is a lot of uh, data transfer that's happening between that pool of containers hosting your machine learning uh, trained models versus, uh, versus the database which from uh, which you'd be getting data uh, for scoring and then sending the scores back to the database. So why would you really need to transfer your models? Uh, the thing is that no single machine learning platform provides everything. Um, there might be some really cool algorithms that Python provides, but then uh, Spark might have its own uh, benefits in terms of some additional algorithms or some other um, stuff that you're looking at. Uh, and that's the reason why um, a lot of these tools would be uh, used in the same company at the same time. Uh, and then there might be some uh, functional considerations as well. Um, you might want to isolate your data between data science team and your production environment. Um, and you might want to um, score your pre-trained models on some edge nodes where uh, you cannot host probably a big solution. So um, there, there is a whole lot of um, use cases where um, model movement or model uh, transfer from one tool to another uh, makes sense. Now, one of uh, the common uh, methods for uh, transferring models from one tool to another is the PMML standard. Uh, it's an XML-based uh, model exchange format, uh, sort of a standard way uh, to define statistical and data mining models, uh, and helps you uh, 
share models between uh, the different applications that are FPM ML compliant. Uh, really popular tool, and that's uh, the tool of choice that we have for moving models uh, to and from Vertica. Now, um, with this model uh, management, uh, with this model movement capability, there's a lot of model management capabilities that Vertica offers. So, uh, models are essentially first-class citizens of Vertica. Uh, what that means is that each model is associated with a DB schema. Um, so the, the user that initially creates a model, that's the owner of it. But he can um, transfer the ownership to other users. He can uh, um, work with the ownership rights in any way that you would work with any other um, relation in a database uh, would be. Uh, so the same commands that you use for granting access to a model, changing its owner, changing its name, or dropping it, you can uh, use similar commands for models as well. Uh, there are a, a lot of functions for exploring the contents of models, and um, that really helps in putting these models into production. Uh, the metadata of these models is also available for model management and governance. Um, and finally, the import-export part um, enables you to apply all of these operations to the models that you have imported or uh, you might want to export um, while they're in the database. And I think it would be uh, nice to actually go through an example uh, to showcase some of these uh, capabilities around model management. Uh, including the PMML uh, model export and import. So the workflow for um, export would, uh, here would be that we'd train some data. We'll train a logistic regression model, um, and we'd save it as an NDB Vertica model. Um, then we'll explore the summary and attributes of the model, look at what's inside the model, what the training parameters are, some coefficients and stuff. Um, and then we can export the model as PMML, and um, uh, an external tool um, can import that model uh, fr uh, from PMML. Um, and similarly, we'll go through an example for export. Uh, there's a, we'll have an external PML model trained outside of Vertica. Uh, we'll import that PML model, um, and it would, uh, from there on, essentially be treated, treated as an NDB PML model. Uh, we'll explore the summary and attributes of the model in uh, much uh, the same way as uh, an NDB model. Uh, we'll apply the model for NDB scoring and get the prediction results, and finally, uh, we'll bring some test data. Uh, we'll use that on test data for which uh, the scoring needs to be done. So uh, uh, first, we want to uh, create a connection with the database. Um, in this case, we are using a Python uh, Jupyter Notebook. Uh, we have the Vertica Python connector here that you can use. Um, a really powerful connector uh, allows you to do a lot of uh, uh, cool stuff with the database uh, using the Jupyter uh, front end. Uh, but essentially, you can use any other SQL uh, front end, too, or uh, for that matter, any other Python ID which uh, lets you connect with the database. So exporting model. Um, first, we'll uh, create a logistic regression model here. Uh, select logistic regression. We'll give it uh, a model name, um, the input relation, which might be a table, temp table, or a view, uh, the response column, and the predictor columns. Um, so we get a logistic regression model as a result. Uh, now we uh, look at the models table and see that the model has been created. This is a table in Vertica that uh, contains a list of all the models uh, that are there in the database. So we can see here that my model that we just created, um, it's uh, created with Vertica models as a category, uh, model type is logistic regression, and we have some other metadata around this model as well. So now uh, we can uh, look at some of uh, the uh, summary statistics of the model. Uh, we can look at the details. So it gives us the predictor, coefficient, standard errors, e-value, and p-value. Uh, we can look at the regularization parameters. We didn't use any, so it, it would be a value of fun. But uh, if you had used, uh, it, it, it would show it uh, up here. Uh, the call string and also um, additional information are, uh, regarding iteration count, rejected row count, and accepted row count. Now, uh, we can also look at the list of attributes of the model. So um, select get model attribute using parameters. Model name is my model. So for this particular model that we just created, it would give us the name of all the attributes that are there. Uh, similarly, you can uh, look at the coefficients of the model in a columnar format. Uh, so uh, using parameter name my model, and in this case, we add the attribute name is equal details because we want all the details for that particular model. And we get the predictor name, coefficient, standard error, z-value, and p-value here. So now uh, what we can do is we can export this model. So we use the select export models, and we give it a path to where we want the model to be exported to. Uh, we give uh, uh, it the name of the model that needs to be exported, that, because essentially you might have a lot of models um, that you have created. And you uh, give it the category here, uh, which in our examples is PMML. Um, and um, you get a status message here that export models has been successful. So now move on to uh, let's move on to the importing models example. Um, in, in much um, the same way that we created a model in Vertica and exported it out, you might want to create a model outside of Vertica 
uh, in another tool and then bring that to Vertica for scoring uh, because Vertica contains all of the hot data and uh, it might make sense to host that model in Vertica uh, because scoring happens a lot more frequently than uh, train model training. Um, so in this particular case, uh, we um, do a select import models, and we are importing a logistic regression model that was that was created in Spark. Uh, the category here is again PMML. So we get um, the status message that import was successful. Um, now let's look at the attributes, uh, look at the models table, and see uh, that the model is really present there. Uh, now previously, when we ran this query, because we had only uh, my model there. Uh, so that was the only entry you saw, but now uh, once this model is imported, you can see that as uh, line item number two here, Spark Logistic Regression, um, it's a uh, public schema. Uh, the category here, however, is different because it's not an indebitated model rather than an imported model. Uh, so uh, you, ha you get PMML here, um, and then uh, other metadata regarding the model as well. Now let's do uh, some of the same operations that we did with the NDB models. We can uh, look at the summary of the imported PMML model. Um, so you can see the function name, data fields, predictors, and um, some additional information here. Moving on, uh, let's look at the at attributes of the PMML model. Uh, select get model attribute. Um, essentially, the same query that uh, we applied earlier, uh, with just um, the difference here is only the model name. Uh, so you get the attribute names, attribute fields, and number of rows. Um, we can also look at the coefficients of the PMML model, name, exponent, and coefficient here. Um, so yeah, pretty much similar to uh, what you can do with an NDB model. You can also uh, perform all the operations on an important model. Um, and one additional thing we'd want to do here is to use this important model for prediction. So um, in this case, we do a select predict PMML and uh, give it um, uh, some values using parameters model name. Uh, and logistic regression and match by position. It's a really cool feature. Um, uh, this is true in this case, uh, set to true. Uh, so if you have model being imported from another platform in which let's say you have uh, 50 columns. Now the name of the columns in that um, environment in which you're training the model might be slightly different than the names of the column that you have set up for Vertica. But as long as the order is the same, uh, Vertica can actually match uh, those columns by position and you don't need to have the exact same names for those columns. So in this case, we have set that to true, and we see that um, predict PML gives a status of one. Um, now, uh, using the imported model, uh, in this case, we uh, had uh, certain uh, values that we had given it, uh, but you can also uh, use it on um, on a table uh, as well. So in that that case, you also get uh, the prediction here, um, and you can look at the confusion metrics to see how well you did. Uh, now. Uh, you know, just, a wrap, just sort of wrapping this up, it's really important to know the important distinction between, uh, you know, using your models in any tool, any single node solution tool that you might already be using like Python or R versus Vertica. What happens is, let's say you built a model in Python. It must uh, might be a single node solution. Now, after building that model, let's say you want to uh, do prediction on really large amounts of data, and you don't want to uh, go through that overhead of um, you know keeping to move that data out of the database to do prediction every time you want to do it. So what you can do is you can import that model into Vertica, but what Vertica does differently than um, Python is that uh, the PMML model would actually be distributed across each node in the cluster. Um, so it would be applying on um, you know the data segments in each of those nodes, and there might be different threads running uh, for that prediction. So the speed that you get here for model prediction would be much, much faster. Similarly, once you uh, build a model for machine learning in Vertica, uh, the objective mostly is that you want to use up all of your data and build a model that's accurate uh, and is not just using a sample of the data, but using you know all the data that's available to it, essentially. Uh, so you can build that model. The model building process would again go through the same, uh, uh, same technique. It would actually be distributed across all the nodes in a cluster, and it would be using up all the threads and processes available to it within those nodes. Um, so really fast model training, but let's say you wanted to deploy it on an edge node and you know uh, maybe do prediction closer to where the data was being generated. So you can export that model in a PMML format and always deploy it on the edge node. Um, so uh, it's really helpful for a lot of use cases. So and just summarizing uh, the takeaways uh, from our um, discussion today. So Vertica is a really powerful tool uh, for machine learning, for data preparation, model training, prediction, and deployment. You might want to use Vertica for all of these steps or some of these steps. Um, either way, Vertica supports you know both approaches. Um, in um, 
the upcoming uh, releases, we are planning to have the model import and export capability through PMML models. Uh, initially, we're supporting k-means linear and logistic regression, uh, but we keep on adding more algorithms, and uh, the plan is to actually move to uh, supporting uh, custom models. Uh, if we want to do that uh, with the upcoming release, uh, TensorFlow integration is always there, which you can use. But uh, with PMML, uh, this is uh, the starting point for us, and we'd keep on improving that. Um, Vertica models can be imported, uh, can be exported in PMML format for scoring on other platforms. And similarly, uh, models that you have built in other tools can be imported for NDB uh, machine learning and this, uh, NDB scoring with Vertica. Um, there are a lot of critical model management tools that are provided in Vertica. And there are um, a lot, a uh, lot of uh, them on the roadmap as well, which we'd keep on developing. Um, many ML functions and algorithms they are already part of uh, the NDB library, and uh, we keep on adding to that as well. So uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, joining the discussion today. And um, if you have any questions, we'd uh, love to take them now. Um, back to you soon.